And who's ready to go steaming ahead into our 76th video about the USS Titan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo. Okay, fine, I can't keep that up forever. Although I could keep going with the rest of the phonetic alphabet, I'm pretty sure you lot want to hear about something more interesting. So let's take a break from the hero ship of Picard and look at something a little bit more... not the Titan. Yeah, that works. Now, if you're anything like me, you are probably expected Season 3 of Picard to begin with a handy cameo from the Enterprise D, eh, for a while the Enterprise E until they shot that down, or maybe even the Enterprise F, because, well, it's in the trailer. But instead, we were treated to a new ship, a ship owned, by the looks of things, by Dr. Beverly Crusher, with an interesting story of its own. But what makes this ship tick? And what do we know about the Phoenix-class SS Elios-12 that Crusher has been using for the last 20 years since Star Trek Nemesis, basically? Well, let's take a look, shall we? Welcome to Trek Central, lords, ladies, and sovereigns. I am your host, Lieutenant Commander Adam. Spoiler alert, this is a video talking about a ship from Star Trek Picard Season 3, as I've already blatantly said, so there will be spoilers because of course there will. You have been warned. Also, let us know what other ships from this new season of Trek or any other era of Trek you would like us to cover next. The mysterious Elashi Kalash frigate? The threatening warship Shrike? My ship? No, we already decided that wasn't going to be a thing, didn't we? Anyway, on to our breakdown of the SS Elios. Engage! Now, the SS Elios 12, NAR 59019, was a Phoenix class ship launched sometime in the late 24th century. The ship class was designed as a small, rapid response ship. This type of vessel would be used to deliver medical supplies, engineering components, or transfer limited personnel on occasion. Presumably, though, the mission profile of the ship was easily reflected in the color scheme, as medical ships usually tend to have blue hull markings, engineering ships are usually yellow, those of a more tactical variety bearing red markings, and anything from the Kelvin universe being horribly, horribly shiny! Ugh. This ship class was recommended to be operated in mid-range mission categories within the Alpha Quadrant, never going anywhere else. The Phoenix class wasn't large either. They're only about 119.7 meters in length, though it seemed to have multiple decks, with deck two being mentioned by the computer system, which was also a weird change, but sure, that works. With this size, however, the crew complement would be very small. Even a single crew member was enough to operate the thing. The ship was also a move towards higher warp speeds in smaller designs with the Phoenix class able to reach a maximum warp speed of 8.7 and a cruising warp speed of warp 7.2. Originally, this class was in Starfleet, however, by the late 24th century and the early 25th, some of them were just classed as surplus, and they would be given to private contractors like the Mariposa Medical Group, or a doctor who had a lot of pull at Starfleet Medical, because those are the same thing, yes. The ship consisted of a semicircular saucer section, try saying that 15 times fast. The saucer section also had an outer edge which would continue to the rear of the ship, where it would connect with a single pylon roll bar that connects the two warp nacelles. The nacelles would also be slightly angled off this pylon strut. The inner section of the saucer housed the bridge module, which of course was extremely rectangular in shape and protruded from the saucer section, nice and vulnerable just the way Star Trek likes it. Along the outer edge, there were lifeboats for evacuation purposes, as well as RCS thruster quads for maneuverability and all the other usual refinements, including an oil slick, rocket launchers hidden behind the headlights, hood-mounted pop-up machine guns, and an ejectable roof. Oh, wait, no, that might actually be Aston Martin that does all that. Never mind. Moving on. The deflector dish was actually mounted at the front of the saucer, which would be somewhat circular in style, but cut off at the bottom, similar to the saucer shape being a bit more semicircular than full size. The nacelles themselves were interesting in design, not only being angled on the ship, but looking more like the late 24th and early 25th century designs we've seen, Perhaps a slight upgrade later in its life, these nacelles featured intercoolers on their top, orange basard ram scoops at the front, and glowing plasma photon spillway flux chillers, 
or warp grills on the sides. At the rear of the nacelle are chilling panels to manage the heat of the nacelle and some RCS thruster quads for extra maneuverability because, you know, being so small, it really struggles in that regard. Sarcasm detected. Near the midpoint of the nacelle would be fins pointing outwards, which would have the name of the vessel, its registry, and for the Elios, which show the Mariposa medical symbol, a butterfly with an M next to it, possibly denoting this Phoenix class as a medical vessel. The roll bar-like structure at the rear of the ship that connected the warp nacelles would house a warp field governor system in the middle, with plasma vents on either side. The ship had two impulse engines on the aft of the saucer section between the nacelle struts, Warp power was provided by a warp core located in the saucer section, and if this warp core needed to be ejected, it could do so out of the underside of the saucer structure. Deuterium for the core would be loaded through the loading ports on the saucer section between the outer edge and the bridge module, whereas antimatter would be located on the underside. The Elios had very limited armaments, which you'd expect, to be honest, from a purely medical vessel, but it did have phaser ring emitters, which were located in the middle of the saucer section above the bridge module, and on the underside of the saucer as well. Also located above the bridge module was an upper planetary sensor array, which complemented the lower planetary sensor array located on the underside of the saucer section. Basically, as far as the Elios' design principles went, if you've got one on the top, you've got to put one on the bottom as well. Am I making sense now? Good. Moving on. These weren't the only sensor systems that the ship had, however, those planetary sensor arrays. There were also the usual lateral sensor strips, which you'd find along the outer edge of the saucer itself. And as with standard Starfleet design philosophy, the vessel would be equipped with deflector shields. There was also a docking port, which was the main way to ingress or egress the ship, Though whether the ship had a transporter system was unknown. This docking port had in front of it an elevator, though whether this allowed small vessels into the ship is not known. The port would allow for ships to dock and for crew and cargo to be transferred. However, what about the cargo, which couldn't fit through the docking port? Well, there were also cargo hatches, located on the underside of the saucer section as well. Not much of the interior was actually shown, though the bridge module was very much shown, with an outer higher area behind the bridge filled with cargo and other sections. Design-wise, the Phoenix class may have been better built up, but the Elios itself was much more functional over form, with pipes and cables lining the ceiling without really much regard to how it looks or how easy it was to trip over them. The Elios would have numerous cargo containers, filling most of its rooms, mostly filled with medical supplies for its medical missions, but sometimes filled with, uh, <laughs> contraband, usually to bribe officials to continue its medical missions or buy medical supplies in the first place. A workstation would be present in the back rooms as well, with old-style medical kits and tricorders on the walls, computer consoles which were present on the Galaxy-class starships, and numerous pieces of tech including some procured from Quark Industries, which, of course, was headed up by Quark of Ferenganar. This back room would connect to the bridge on its starboard side, with another door on the port side of the bridge, and it looked to be connected to an isolated room, as someone could be locked in there by locking that single door. Just like the bridge module, the bridge section itself was entirely rectangular, with a forward console that could control the vessel completely, quite similar to other NAR vessels such as the USS Raven, operated by the Hansons. And also similar to the USS Raven, there would be a view screen at the front of the bridge. However, this view screen could have a blast shield deployed for extra protection against attack or spatial anomalies, and would seemingly activate automatically when the ship was in danger. There would be a central interactive table in the bridge that could also be utilized by the crew as well. Uh, Assuming in the same way that the pool table from the Enterprise D's engineering set could be used. Not just as like, uh-oh, the ship's under attack, quick, let's play some D&D. &D. What, do they have D&D &D in Star Trek? Beside the forward console, there were two standing consoles, which would display information and controls relevant to the operation of the ship. Along the wall of the bridge section were more screens that showed even more ship systems, like the warp coils and the warp core status. Alongside one of these walls would be a shelf filled with mementos from its captain, Dr. Beverly Crusher. 
The SS Elios was captained by Dr. Crusher, of course, after she had resigned from Starfleet sometime after the Shinzon Crisis of 2379 and went out to become a Doctors Without Borders member, basically, and provided medical care to planets abandoned or straight up forgotten about by Starfleet and the Federation. I mean, that's pretty terrible if you ask me. Uh, how exactly do you forget an entire planet? Like, oh, I've just found a planet behind the couch. Ah, yeah, fancy that. Is it worth anything? No. Put it back, then. I think I'm losing it. I've done too many of these. As a Starfleet surplus ship before Beverly resigned, she managed to pull some strings at Starfleet Medical to procure it for her own use. The ship would then become a medical vessel operating under the Mariposa Medical Group. That group can trace its origins all the way back to the 21st century and a medical clinic, Clinica Las Mariposas which was located in Los Angeles on Earth. It was run by Dr. Teresa Ramirez, who would help those who usually couldn't get access to medical support at the time. In 2024, Teresa would end up meeting Cristobal Rios, of course, after he traveled back in time from 2401 on a mission with Admiral Picard to save the timeline from Q. Rios would stay in the 21st century with Teresa, where they would eventually marry, and together they would start the Mariposa Medical Movement. Teresa providing the medical care, and Rios captaining the organization with his skills garnered from Starfleet. This movement would endure all the way to the 25th century, helping those in medical need, beginning in the tumult of the 21st century, and reaching all the way to the 25th, which is a hell of a lineage. It seemed that Beverly would join this movement to help provide medical aid to those who needed it. She would be joined on her journey by her young son, Jack Crusher, and essentially brought him up aboard the ship. However, this medical mission would be put on hold in 2401. The Elios spent much of that year on the run from unknown assailants who could apparently change their faces and use multiple different ships to pursue Jack and Beverly both. The Elios would enter orbit of Sarnia Prime, which sounds like a sandwich to me, to treat refugees who were suffering from Galarian fever. However, they would be approached by the Fenris Rangers, who would alert the marked woman of their whereabouts. While being pursued by this marked woman, and foes disguised as Klingons and the Federation in places such as Kafar and Exoport, the vessel would be kept running at the lowest possible power levels in order to avoid further detection. Three Ilachi starships, a species who had been active in Romulan space since the supernova, would however locate the Elios and try to dock with the ship. Foes not of Ilachi origin would successfully board, but be defeated by Beverly with a custom-modified phaser rifle. However, she would be seriously injured in the process. With more foes incoming, Beverly would send a coded distress signal to Admiral Jean-Luc Picard while charging the warp drive of the vessel and fleeing to a nebula near the Riton system where they would hide from their pursuers. She would then be put in a medical pod by her son, Jack Crusher. Picard and longtime friend William T. Riker, traveling aboard the Federation starship USS Titan A, would commandeer a vessel, the shuttlecraft Savik, and find the Elios adrift in the nebula in the Riton system. Quickly aboard, they would find Beverly and her son, but they would be quickly located by the Shrike, a Mary Sue, uh, sorry, a ship used by an unknown adversary known as Vadik, who would destroy their shuttle and try to kidnap Jack by transporting him off the vessel. This would fail, however, and even a tractor lock on the Elios would fail with the help of the USS Titan warping in to save the ship at the last second. All four people on the Elios were then transported to the Titan. Vadik would make herself known to the Titan and its crew and give an ultimatum to hand over Jack or be destroyed. As a show of power, she would utilize a reverse tractor beam with an anti-gravitational polarity phasing and would throw the SS Elios at the Titan, which destroyed the Elios outright and ripped a hole in Deck 11 on the Titan. And with that comes the end of the SS Elios. But where does the name come from in the first place? Well, strap in, fellow nerds, and I shall tell thee. <laughs> the name Elios comes from Greek mythology. Elios was the personification of mercy and compassion. And what a fitting name, really, for a medical ship owned by our favorite Trek doctor, well, not mine, Beverly Crusher. The design of the SS Elios actually came about before Star Trek Picard was even a glint in the eyes of the producers. 
Just like with the Inquiry class vessels seen in Season 1 and upgraded in Seasons 2 and 3, the Elios originally comes from a design by John Eaves. Because who else, my friends? As an engineering vessel known as the USS Phoenix for Star Trek Online. This makes sense why the Elios is indeed a Phoenix-class ship. The vessel would not be present in Star Trek Online, however, as the concept would be from the studio that owned Star Trek Online before Cryptic Studios actually launched the game. The USS Phoenix would be slightly different from the Elios we got in the end. The semicircular saucer section, attached to nacelle pylon struts that jut backwards and have nacelles attached at an angle to them, would still be present in the final design. But the bridge itself was different. It was much more rectangular on the Elios in order to conceivably fit the bridge set created for Picard Season 3, as well as the pylon connecting the two warp nacelles to each other at the rear. The ship would also be much larger in the early concept art, with multiple decks noticeable from the windows, making it at minimum four to five decks tall. The ship also had actual shuttle bays and not just a docking port where shuttles could land and dock inside the ship. Interestingly, there's also a concept of a TOS version of this ship. Circular nacelles, underslung dish deflector. Yep, sounds like TOS, all right. The design of this new Phoenix class, seen in Star Trek Picard Season 3, was done by John Eaves, Doug Drexler, Dave Blass, and Terry Matalas. In early concept art by Eaves of the SS Elios itself, the ship was still slightly bigger, with the shuttle which Riker and Picard used to board it being much smaller than it seems by comparison in the final shot. This is because on the models of the shuttle and the Elios, the docking ports were perfectly sized, so at some stage it was decided the Elios would actually be a little smaller. Another cool fact is that the shot of the shuttle landing on the Elios was handled by a junior artist, who did such a fantastic job that they allowed them to do the rest of the shot as well. Get in. In the interior, the Elkar's displays were intentionally made to be like those from The Next Generation, as the Elios is said to be a ship from about the same era. The handheld weapons aboard the Elios are custom modded by the Crushers, relying on old tech in the main. Interestingly, the phaser pistol held on Riker is a mix of the Final Frontier Assault Phaser and the original series phaser design. Power salt, power salt depleted. Ah! And the phaser rifle, which Beverly uses, takes a lot of inspiration from the first-person shooter game Star Trek Voyager Elite Force. The interior was developed by one of Picard's art directors, Liz Klukowski, who would do such a great job creating a ship that is almost a home for these two crushers. That makes them sound like really bad wrestlers that are forced to travel together all the time. Uh, Liz would work alongside set director Shauna Aronson and ensure that the bridge module and the rest of the ship would be littered with references to Beverly's past and Trek's past as well. Most notably is the shelf in the bridge module, which would contain pictures of Jack R. Crusher, her former husband, and Wesley Crusher, her other son that nobody ever talks about. A book called How to Advance Your Career Through Marriage, which was given as a gift by Jack R. Crusher when he asked her to marry him, also featured. A few other highlights include the Carrington Award, something Bashir was nominated for in Deep Space Nine, an Honorary Citizen of Corcoroli Five Award she got when she eradicated the Firox Plague in Allegiance, and I'm sure many, many more. There would also be some reuse from Picard, with the old-style medical tricorder seen in Season 1 finding a place on a medical kit. There was even some technology procured from Quark Industries that would find its way onto the Elios. And now, all the trinkets are floating through a nebula. In space. It just makes me sad. We may not have seen the ship for very long, but what did you think of it? Did you enjoy this new addition to the Star Trek roster of ships? Let us know in the comments below. As always, if you are talking Trek, then we want to hear about it. If you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from our team here at Trek Central. You can also join us on social media or the community Discord server. But for now, I've been Lieutenant Commander Adam. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.